Hello everybody, this is Drew Demon, the Devil's Stockbroker, and I'm doing an update on the market situation currently as of August 19th. This is Friday close. It's been uh, it's been quite a week in the market, I gotta say. So between AMC's massive rise up into uh, uh, up to around uh, twenty seven dollars and to its current position now down to eighteen oh one. BBIG's explosive return from NASDAQ delisting slash suspension after it's been uh, embroiled in a court battle between John Colucci, the current, I loosely declare him, the CEO of Inco Ventures uh, versus Ted Farnsworth and Lisa King of the Ted Farnsworth Group and Zash Global Media. Biora announcing an absolutely killer earnings early on this week. And Revlon showing some massive strength despite the repeated beatdowns that it's received, pushing it down below $10 that it couldn't quite break out of, but nevertheless has closed very strongly at just under $8.50. Currently, there's a lot of things happening all across the entire market, namely the fact that every single meme stock that uh, can call itself such has been ripping and being ripped back down uh, throughout the entire trading week. Despite all the excitement, the one thing that I want to actually focus on is uh, actually more blue chip plays. The, uh, the market overall has been uh, on this absolutely thunderous recovery, namely with Apple coming back from its lows on the year up 35% over the last two months to close above $1.75 uh, $175 on uh, on the 17th of August it's now begun to show some weakness along with several other big blue chips tickers and i wanted to point out a few trends and statistics on the overall market just to point out that what i believe is happening is we are now witnessing the top of the market so the first thing that i want to look at here is the nasdaq so the NASDAQ is extremely tech heavy for a market index. And uh, one of the first things that happen in market crashes is you start to see the tech sector begin to suffer. This has been true ever since the tech sector really took off starting in um, mainly 2000 uh, during the dot-com bubble. So from the 90s till 2000, the tech sector absolutely ripped and roared up till its all-time highs before it ran into some serious trouble with a bunch of zombie companies that basically lost their ability to stay profitable or were never profitable in the first place and the speculation euphoria completely evaporated out of all of the stocks that were traded on the NASDAQ and that resulted in a massive decline. Well, we're having a very similar situation right now in the market where the NASDAQ is very, very chock full of zombie companies or money losing companies that are more or less just burning capital by pulling in a ton of loans from Either, uh, either corporate bonds or from angel investors and, uh, and other similar such funding sources. And right now, NASDAQ has been printing this big bear flag on the, uh, on the daily chart for a long period of time. The NASDAQ has been absolutely ripping since June of this year, but has begun to form this ascending wedge, which it recently broke through. This break, this critical break of this technical trading pattern shows that there is weakness in the NASDAQ, and that is why I've basically gone short on every single top ticker on the NASDAQ, as well as shorting the NASDAQ directly by going short on the Qs. So the Q is very similar to the NASDAQ. It's an ETF that directly tracks the NASDAQ and is focused entirely on mainly uh, financial and tech sector companies. <clears throat> And the Qs have been showing that same weakness. We actually were beginning to gap down below this ascending wedge that it had formed at that time. And what we saw was the uh, candle could not quite close above. We had tested the lows of this wedge on the 17th of August before gapping back up, closing just below that wedge at 329 on the Qs. And then suddenly we gapped far down below. And this was the sign of weakness. This single candle right here means everything that I've been talking about for the last three months, that the market is overvalued, 
and that we are looking at a massive decline coming. Since we entered into this bear market, the entire market has been basically forming bearish megaphone channels all across the board, where you see the price bouncing up and down throughout the last seven months. Now, from where we're currently sitting on the queues, we have at least a $80 downside between us and the bottom of this megaphone pattern. Where I'm actually estimating that we'll end up at is somewhere close to 200 on the queues before the end of November. But on a more uh, modest or conservative model, I'm placing a take profit at between 250 and 260 by the end of September. Looking back on the SQs, which is the short inverse EPTF for the queues, We've noticed this cycle wave pattern on the SQs because of its volatility and because it's a leveraged ETF. We've noticed that there's been these big wave patterns in the queues before it has a swing in the opposite direction. And each time these waves have begun to get bigger and bigger. This is uh, somewhat in reference to Michael Burry's uh, bullwhip effect that he referenced, uh, I believe it was three months ago, referencing uh, market volatility becoming more and more pronounced where the falls and the peaks in the market get more volatile and excessive as time goes on and as liquidity crises and collateral crises begin to play themselves out in the market. And because of this, I'm expecting that there's going to be an extreme cycle hitting us very soon. We're not certain that it's going to be the big one, but I do feel confident in saying that we're due for some pullback in the market overall. Moving over to the SPX, we see a similar bull flag pattern turning up again, where we have these bearish megaphones showing up over and over. And as you can see, we have tapped the top. If we look over at the moving averages, we can see that we're starting to just hit our heads right there on that 200 period moving average, that line in red that's tracking the net, uh, the SPX. And as uh, as we've seen before many times in the market, every time the market hits a top on these specific moving averages, it usually means a lot more pain is ahead of us. So early this week, I paid very close attention once I saw that this doji candle had printed with a wick that just touched the 200 period moving average. This wick shows that we were never able to break this significant level, which has proven to be a, a significant area of resistance. As you noted, may notice, we had a gap in this area before, and it once served as support, which now it's serving as resistance and a massive zone of supply for shares on the SPX index. And this includes uh, other ETFs such as the SPY, uh, the XLRE index, the XLE index, all of those other ETFs that track uh, tech, real estate, and energy. And since we printed this doji, we have not yet been able to break to the upside on any of these. And just today, this very large red bearish engulfing candle brought us all the way back to where we were trading on Friday the previous week at its open. And what I'm expecting is that the market is not going to enjoy what comes next. I want to go a step further and point out a, uh, a little bit of history, statistically speaking, where we see midterm election year seasonality playing a huge factor in the market's behavior. What we notice is in every single year when we have had a, uh, when we've had a Democratic president, the August, September, October months are extremely bearish. Overall, August sees just a little bit of early bullishness or maybe a little bit of sideways chop before the market completely sells off starting in late August all throughout early September and again in October. And this appears to be true for both second year new Democratic president, which is currently where we're at, and the uh, first term mid-year for uh, for those representatives and senators that are due for midterm re-election. 
So the red line is the one that's most important to pay attention to on this seasonality chart, where you see that at towards the tail end of August, we get this massive sell-off going into the beginning of September before we have some sideways chop and another sell-off going into the very end of September. And then in October, we start to see a little bit of pullback and a, uh, a rebound by the time the holidays approach. In every single one of these cases, we've never seen the charts in the stock market retest the May highs. For the red line, we see a big sell-off from May from the highs going down into July, a rebound all the way up through early August, and then a sell-off back down into the end of September. In all of these charts, none of them do you see a retest of the highs. And this is what I want to warn everybody of and point out. Because... Everybody is currently expecting that the market is done selling off. For whatever reason, this idea that we're coming out of this bear market, even though it would be historically the shortest bear market of all time, and we are testing a high with a 23% retracement from the, uh, from the lows in June, this would be perfectly in line with our average bear market rally, which is 23%. And this is a statistic that comes from Michael Burry. On the 12th, Michael Burry tweeted that the NASDAQ is now up 23% off its low. Congratulations, we have the average bear market rally. Statistically significant data shows that every single bear market sees one of these massive rallies coming off of lows that are massive fakeouts and treat, uh, in, it entreats everybody to start going long into the market. For those that haven't been paying attention to the 10 2 year yield curve, we're still in inversion. And it isn't actually the inversion that signals a crash or a recession. Rather, it's just a warning signal. In fact, in most of the recessions that we've ever experienced, the inversion tends to lag behind by 6 to 18 months between every single recession. Note that the inversion in August of 2019 came a full six months before we entered into the COVID panic. The inversion in 2006 came 18 months before we entered into the recession in 2008, and it wasn't declared until after the market had already crashed. The 2000 uh, the 2000.com bubble, the inversion occurred back in March of 2000, and the Nasdaq started to sell off, but we didn't actually enter the recession until January, February of 2001, and it wasn't declared until after that summer. If we were to paint over recession bars and show the actual dates from the time that we inverted on the yield curve to the time that we came uh, to the actual capitulation crashes in every single market, those moves came between 6 and 18 months apart, with the exception of the COVID crash that actually happened only, uh, only four months later due to a black swan event. If we just give ourselves an average estimate from the time that uh, we actually inverted on the curve starting back in March of this year, the real market downturn wouldn't be due until September of 2023. At the rate at which our market is falling and with the number of events going on between war with Russia and the Ukraine, a potential war or at the very least a trade war with China, a fight over semiconductors and the island of Taiwan, the massive rise and fall in the price of oil and the cause of uh, massive inflation in the United States and across the globe. All in all, the situation is looking extremely bad for the market going forward, and we've barely even retraced from our highs. Look at this curve on the logarithmic scale, and you will see very clearly that our market hasn't even come close to doing what the dot-com crash, the global financial crisis, or even the COVID crash managed to do. Before we even come close to seeing the market recover or going back to a bull market, every single time that we've had one of these crashes, we have had to return to the peak of the previous all-time high before the uh, before the previous market crash, and that would put us at just about the peak of the COVID crash back here. So you've heard me talk about market crashes coming, and you've heard what I'm so uh, the reasons why. 
now I'm going to tell you where I'm putting my money and uh, what I'm buying or what I'm selling in order to protect and hedge myself from a market downturn. For the short term, I'm focusing on techs and semiconductors. Right now, I believe that Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Tesla are all due for a massive pullback, Apple being the biggest one among them. What I'm expecting from Apple is a very rapid descension back to this previous high in the market before we start to form a shoulder and then resume our fall going into late September. On a longer time frame, I'm anticipating that Apple is going to find some resistance along its 200 period moving average. That's this line. I'm expecting Apple to find some support going up until the point of its earnings, at which point earnings compression, which has been true of every major stock indice uh, for the last three months, shows that earnings are beginning to compress. And what we're experiencing with all of these extremely bullish earnings and bullish outlooks across the market is showing that it's not actually good earnings, but rather the result of inflation causing the massive influx of high price products resulting in a better than average revenue while sales themselves are declining. And as a result of that, when people stop going to the stores to buy all of their iPhones and iPads and uh, MacBooks, Apple's earnings are going to be much, much worse than anticipated in Q3. For that reason, I'm expecting just an ordinary retrace coming back from the top uh, of Apple's current position here all the way back down to retest its 200 moving average at around $150 per share. Going closer to earnings, once we start to see some strength and uh, recovery coming into Apple, I plan to short it again just before earnings as it goes into the Q3 session. Assuming that I can get a good price, I plan to ride those out all the way until January of 2023, and I am playing those down to a low of $100. Amazon's in a similar situation, but more bearish as a result of the uh, big pullback in retail sales. From a technical perspective, Amazon has tapped on its 200 period moving average, but was never able to break resistance. And just by the very nature of that pattern, I anticipate Amazon is going to retest its previous lows here. At which point, we'll anticipate some more consolidation, maybe a bear flag going into earnings before another crash to follow. Google I find to be a little bit more insulated than Amazon and Apple. However, I do still anticipate a pullback during which Google is likely to see some retracement going back down till the $100 price target just before the end of September. And it is likely that it will retrace to the middle of this regression channel before earnings before seeing an additional sell-off and breaking the channel. This is the plan that I have for Google. I'm not currently trading Google. However, my overall outlook on the company is bearish going into Q3. Microsoft is surprisingly well above its 200 period moving average, but I still anticipate as a result of this resistance, which it was not able to break through, this area of previously support, this gap right here uh, from back in April, is proving to show some very stiff resistance for Microsoft. And as a result, they were not able to break this price level back up to its previous high of $300. And since we have gapped down as of this red engulfing candle, we have now established the head on a head and shoulders, as well as completing this butterfly cipher pattern, which you see highlighted here. Naturally, what butterfly ciphers tend to do is they tend to follow a Fibonacci retracement going from the lows to the highs, and they tend to retest as far low as the 127% retracement level down here. As a result, I'm expecting Microsoft to return to this price target by the end of September. And that would look something like this. For NVIDIA, it's a little bit more straightforward. There's clearly a bear flag 
showing up on the Nvidia charts. And now that the price, uh, uh, now that the chips bill has been priced into the market, I'm anticipating that despite the uh, heavy subsidization from the government, this bear flag is very likely to play out. We can see this bear flag with a very large tail on uh, NVIDIA is beginning to play out. And now that we're bumping our heads off of the top of this 200 period moving average, I'm anticipating making our way back down to the bottom. And likely, I'm anticipating that earnings are going to be especially bad for NVIDIA going into the uh, Q3 earnings period. And that this will result in NVIDIA's first wave of sell-offs down to the 75 level. And this would bring NVIDIA back to its previous peak on uh, just before the COVID crash in 2020. So this is my outlook for NVIDIA with, a, with my first take profit being here at the $115 level, the last take profit being in the $80 to $85 level. For Tesla, despite how much I love this company, I am looking at the technicals and I don't like what I see. Tesla has been showing this uh, expanding megaphone pattern beginning to develop, and this regression channel shows that the company is still quite overvalued. So even if I were to trade this to the top of the uh, to the top of this uh, megaphone pattern, which I'm not going to do, I'm going to short Tesla immediately. I'm doing it based off of several technical patterns. To start with, for Tesla, what I've noticed in its charts trading pattern is it's kind of done this very strange coiling action, making lower lows and and lower highs, where there's this consistently very large spike to the upside every single time testing the top of this megaphone. However, what we saw is that as soon as Tesla tried to do this here, it failed immediately and it couldn't break and hold support above its 200 period moving average. As a result of that, I think that this is going to be it for Tesla for the rest of the year. And I think that Elon Musk's company is unfortunately going to see some of its uh, lowest prices that it's seen in the last two years, I anticipate Tesla after its split to immediately fall back to $400 by the time its earnings hits. After its split, this is going to look more like $150 or $140. This is a uh, three to one split hitting for Tesla. And part of my uh, Part of my suspicion is that Tesla is already in an extremely weak state and position due to this double topping formation that we see here. But because of this split, investors are holding on to their positions, expecting to sell as soon as that split takes place. As a result of that, I'm getting early into some puts just before the split, and I plan to ride those all the way until November. In support of my thesis for all of these stocks, I've been referencing the VIX. Each time, I've noticed that the VIX has shown a channel form every single time that a large move was going to take place to the downside. And every single time, the VIX channel, it broke out of that channel, retested that channel, and then made a run for new highs. And once again, we see this playing out over and over again. Now we have to yet break out of the channel on the VIX. This has been an especially long, long downtrend for the WIX, which is quite unusual. So what I'm anticipating for the WIX to do next is to break out very suddenly, tap its 200 moving average, retrace, and test this channel as support before it finally takes off to the upside. So what I'm waiting for before taking a very large position on the VIX is for this bump off of the 200 to take place. I plan to short the VIX back to its original channel. And at this point, I'll be buying calls on the VIX going out until November with the anticipation that the VIX could see highs as significant as 50. 
One additional play for me that's uh, quite bearish on the market overall is the XLRE index. This is the housing and real estate sector index. Uh, this one's also been trading in a mega foam pattern, very similar to Tesla. However, this is considered a defensive play, so there's still quite a little bit of um, there's quite a bit of waiting to be done on this one. As a result, I think that we may not yet see the lows in XLRE until uh, halfway into uh, Q1 of 2023. So it may take us some time, but I do anticipate that XLRE will eventually test these lows down at $30 or lower by January of 2023. So as a result, I'm looking at long-term leap puts for January 2023, February 2023, and January 2024. As soon as there are some new puts available for the uh, for the June-July months, I'll be looking at those also. I do actually anticipate quite a bit of contraction in the real estate market, especially as the uh, Fed is forced to go more hawkish if their inflation, uh, their inflation fighting measures have not been as effective as they had hoped. And as a result, they'll have to get more hawkish. And as a result, the mortgage lending industry will increase its 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage rate on average across the nation. This will cause the real estate market to react very negatively as sales decline. And as you can see, the DRV, which is the real estate bearish index, which is three times leveraged, has been trading in this regression channel where it's hit the tops, bottoms, tops, and bottoms within less than a six month period. So with that in mind, I anticipate that DRV could return back to its top of this channel and even exceed it by November. So as a result, I'll be taking a long position in DRV going out till November. Just to be clear, XLRE and DRV are opposite of each other. DRV is a short, going long on DRV is a short against the housing market, the same way that going short on XLRE is going short on the housing market. So please try not to get confused and make sure that you understand very clearly what this device is because it's uh, quite a lot more volatile and a bit more dangerous than just going short on the XLRE index by itself. One additional economic factor that I'm paying very close attention to is this technical pattern here on US oil showing a very large megaphone which we are now testing the bottoms of. If we start to see US oil uh, begin, to re uh, begin to show some strength here and returning to the $100 a barrel price level, I anticipate that uh, this is going to end up serving as confirmation. But just paying more attention to the larger macroeconomic events, Russia is getting more aggressive with uh, claiming that it's going to be shutting down the Nord Stream pipeline to uh, Germany and Europe, which is going to make natural gas more expensive, but it's going to also make crude oil more expensive. The Saudis uh, are competing quite stiffly for uh, oil prices right now. But I anticipate that with war and a crisis in the energy sector looming, that we will see oil start to surge massively in the coming months. And if we do end up seeing oil retest previous highs somewhere in the neighborhood of $130 to $140 per barrel, then this is going to cause energy stocks to run. For that reason, it's worth paying very close attention to this technical pattern. This is a bearish pennant which is forming on the XLRE index. However, it's beginning to look as though it's trying to break out of its top of its channel. If we do end up seeing confirmation of this candle closing outside of this channel, then we may end up seeing XLRE and energy stocks going on a run to retest previous highs at $90 between now and November. An additional bet that you could make in order to target a specific stock in this sector is ZOM, that's Exxon Mobil Corporation, which has been trading on a bull flag over the last several months. And we are now testing an exit at this point. If we do see that Exxon Mobil breaks this pattern, then next week I anticipate Exxon to retest its previous highs at $108 and possibly go even a little bit further than that. You can actually see the same pattern playing out for multiple energy stocks, including Chevron, which is another American oil company uh, based primarily in the uh, western states and 
Houston, Texas. I anticipate that Chevron will also do well. And furthermore, uh, it's worth noting that Warren Buffett has been extremely bullish on Chevron along with Occidental Petroleum for the last six months, and he's been quite vocal about buying more and more shares lately. So I do anticipate that if this uh, flag breaks to the upside, then Chevron might uh, might even see new all-time highs in the distant future. Before we uh, close out this video, I'll round up with a few of the meme stocks, which we've been paying very close attention to. At the moment, AMC looking extremely badly beaten down, but still forming what I believe could be an ascending triangle and possibly even a cup and handle, dare I say it. Right now, AMC has been severely beaten down going into its, uh, its equity split with uh, a preferred equity. Um, our AMC preferred equity shares, ticker symbol APE, which are going to begin trading starting on Monday, the 22nd. A reminder to watch the APE uh, failures to deliver and large amounts of short exempts on APE. What I anticipate happening is a liquidity and uh, collateral crisis for brokers who are unable to locate shares of APE that must be delivered to their customers on time. If we see a large amount of failures to deliver in APE, then it could result in a buying frenzy that affects AMC and APE indirectly. If we do end up seeing that rebound, then we may end up watching AMC soaring to new highs once again. However, this is a uh, this is a very um, speculative scenario, so I want to caution you not to go betting the farm on something like this. It's uh, it's it's possible, but certainly not something that I know for any degree of certainty. So please take what I say with a grain of salt. And make sure that you uh, don't bet more than you're willing to lose. This one is a dangerous situation right now. I am going to briefly cover Bed Bath & Beyond. I haven't been particularly vocal about this stock. I did play it. Uh, I actually played it from uh, I played it from five dollars and eight uh, around twelve dollars up to the uh, twenty dollar price level before I completely cut everything off. So I didn't quite time the top, but I'm very happy with my uh, with my profit taking and. Uh, listening to my uh, strategy, so I'm I'm quite content with uh, with my gains there. I didn't um, I didn't stay vocal about it because plenty of other people had already covered Bed Bath and Beyond, but I was overall bullish on the stock, and I'm really happy that everybody else made some stupid good money. I've been paying very close attention to BBIG, the ongoing civil suit between John Colucci of Vinco Ventures with Ted Farnsworth and Lisa King of Zash Global Media is still ongoing. I'm anticipating that the Zash uh, Global Media team is easily going to win because John Colucci has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. And while I cannot prove it, I, all of his actions have indicated to me that he has been uh, nothing more than a corporate saboteur keen on destroying the stock's, uh, the stock's price and possibly being involved in the theft of intellectual property and uh, and copyrighted content from Zash Global Media Partners, AdRiser, and MindTank. This is currently still being investigated, so uh, please stay close to the story. I'll be sure to continue uh, keeping everybody posted and apprised of any new information that I can find. But in the meanwhile, what I have noticed is that BBIG on the daily chart has bounced off of its 200 period moving average before retracing back to its 50. So that's uh, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit, <laughs> well, disappointing, I guess is the word that I would use. But uh, I am, uh, I am, I'm quite faithful that uh, we have yet to see, we have more gains yet to see. So the volatility coming out of its uh, suspension was pretty spectacular. BBIG immediately took off before forming a bull flag and then breaking out again, bull flagging again, and breaking out again before it finally relaxed and formed this uh, this very small retracement and bear flag before it collapsed back down, gapping down to around the $1 level or $1.10. Overall, I'd say that uh, BBIG still performed extraordinarily well 
uh, throughout everything that's been going on with the stock this past uh, this past week. It was a it was a spectacular reentry to the market coming out of uh, suspension. And honestly, I think that once Colucci is kicked out with a foot in his ass out the door from uh, Vinco Ventures, that uh, the Zash Global Media team is likely going to carry through with uh, acquiring BBIG and bringing the company together with AdRiser, MindTank, and Lomotif, setting a new social media giant on its way to becoming the king of social media globally. GameStop overall this month has uh, been experiencing quite a run since uh, since the beginning of June, but has uh, since broken through a significant level of rising support and tes- uh, tested its 200 moving average, breaking through it. Oh, excuse me, that was on the hourly. It has tested its 200 moving average on the daily, and now we are waiting to see a bounce. Uh, at the moment, GameStop has already tested the top of a regression channel, so if uh, this 200 moving average support does not hold, I anticipate GameStop returning back to the bottom of this regression channel before earnings. It, uh, it will remain to be seen what happens in the wake of earnings, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see. And now we come to my two squeeze picks of the uh, of the month that I am currently targeting right now. Curve is trading with a uh, spectacular looking cup and handle. It's retraced quite a bit from its highs recently uh, since Monday, but I'm still quite bullish on the stock. Uh, what I am anticipating is that it will have to drop one more time to test the bottom of this channel before it takes off again and then starts setting up new levels of support. Uh, overall, this company's thesis is that they uh, they're they're a very well to they're a very well structured women's clothing company focused on uh, plus size and average size women. Uh, they're primarily based out of the Americas, and um, honestly, I've I've been to their stores, I've uh, seen their products. They got some really nice stylish clothes, and their sales are up. Financially speaking, their earnings has been improving over the last year. Um, they got hurt pretty badly in the COVID pandemic, and they. Uh, they had a, uh, a rough sell-off uh, since their uh, since their IPO. They they actually got punished pretty badly coming out of uh, 2021, all the way down from previous highs, well above $25. So this is only the beginning right here. What I see this as is just the first sign of strength before the stock starts to really begin to uh, get moving in the right direction. This long consolidation that we've seen here forming this uh, descending wedge or descending channel on curve has honestly just been accumulation as far as I'm concerned. And now that we're seeing this nice little pickup of volume, it just kind of uh, goes to show that uh, the stock has quite a bit of interest and it just needs some time to catch on. But I'm finding that uh, curve looks really financially sound. And I want to thank DM Calls for bringing this one to my attention and uh, having me take a look at it. I'm, I'm really liking the setup for the company. And, I mean, you really don't even have to ask me twice. I think that uh, I think they've got some really uh, great financials. And after they get through this uh, little bit of uh, this little bit of resistance, that this one could definitely be the next runner, similar to Redbox or um, or Revlon. Speaking of Revlon. I'm very happy to see that Revlon did manage to show some strength going into Friday close. It wasn't as much as I was hoping for, but it was more than what was needed in order to push it above the 750 level. This level was all that was necessary. This price was all that we needed in order to ensure that Revlon closed with a significant portion of its float in the money, and that has happened. So now that Revlon has shown this tremendous amount of strength, closed above 850, uh, 845, excuse me, <clears throat> it has put almost 25% of its float in the money as of this Friday. So next week, starting on Tuesday at the morning bell, I'm anticipating that delivery of Rev shares is going to be due for all of the options that expire at all these price levels. And there's quite a lot of them. 
many of the calls that were uh, purchased prior to uh, the run from four dollars all the way up to uh, up to the uh, eleven dollar level. Most of these had actually been early exercised. I would say that everything from four dollars up to seven dollars was all in the money and everything was exercised so all of these contracts were taken off the table as soon as they were uh, as soon as they were brought deep into the money and all of those shares were absorbed now that the stock has uh, gotten past this uh, this big big pivotal moment I think that Revlon is due to uh, have a little bit of consolidation while all of these gains are uh, accumulated and more shares get bought up by institutions that are going to turn long on the company. The bankruptcy is still up in the air right now with the bankruptcy courts giving Revlon a 1.4 billion cash injection that gives them quite a lot of runway to get their operations profitable again and figure out a way to pay back their debtors. However, Revlon, if you'll remember, is engaging in a lawsuit right now with their debtors because it's believed that they engaged in a malicious uh, debt restructuring and repayment set, uh, set up. So it looks like Revlon may have been the victim of some loan shark activity, but that is not clear yet at this time. In the, uh, in the short term, I'm anticipating that Revlon will have some chop and uh, we may not yet see any kind of, uh, any kind of bullishness or a big run in the stock for the time being. At the moment, though, it held up a significant level of strength, and it is still setting up higher lows, and that's the important thing. Looking at it on the uh, on the long term, we can see one other big bullish pattern that I want to point out to everybody because it's it is so so critical. What we see here on Revlon, going all the way back to the beginning of its run, starting in the uh, in middle of June 2022, is that Revlon is setting up an ascending triangle, and if you don't no ascending triangles this is actually quite a bullish pattern and it tends to be a bit of a reversal pattern and can actually be the other side of a cup and handle in certain cases now in a reversal pattern the ascending triangle shows up after there's been a significant period of selling off in a stock which as you can see based off of Revlon's channel it's been that way for quite a while it's been sort of just consolidating to the downside for a long, long, long period of time. Now that they've gotten this big surge, we notice that here at the $10 level, they just can't seem to break through that ceiling. It's been acting as a barrier for the stock where it can't quite break past. And it's no surprise because there was more than 50% of the calls, 50% uh, of the float was going to end up in the money on the call chain starting at that $10 level. So going forward there could be some serious serious movement on this stock if it manages to break through this ceiling and uh, i feel like once it does break through it it's it's going to start taking off without everybody and i don't mean to say that uh to just like put in pointless hype but i've just observed that these technical patterns have played out so consistently that despite the downturn in Revlon's recent price action, I'm still overall very bullish on the stock. And despite the uh, bankruptcy, I think that their uh, their intellectual property and their brand recognition is far more valuable to them. And for that reason, I anticipate that Revlon will end up surviving this uh, this this period of uh, of strife, and uh, they will eventually return to their previous all time highs. In the near term, we may have to wait a while, but I, in the long term, I would anticipate that Revlon will eventually break out of this uh, this consolidation and get back above the $10 level. And there is one, at least one other whale of a trader who seems to agree. I would like to introduce you to the uh, Revlon call chain currently uh, that is uh, set up here. And right now we see that now that uh, August 19th is behind us. The call chain is relatively empty. The uh, strikes at $10 are still quite large. But uh, one thing that I'm uh, looking at now is the calls all the way out at $35 expiring in January of 2023, which you'll notice that 50% of the float is sitting on exactly that strike price. And what I want to point out is that these calls 
went onto the chain all at once. 25,000 call contracts were purchased all at the same time over the course of the last two trading weeks during this massive upward price action. So at least one other whale is extremely bullish and believes that Revlon is going to go back to its all-time highs and possibly go even further beyond. For all we know, this could be a signal of a uh, anticipated acquisition, but at some point before January of 2023, this trader is anticipating that we will be trading somewhere up in this area or above it. And uh, that, to me, is, uh, that is highly encouraging. Just to give the opposite possible scenario, um, it is possible that somebody may have just simply been selling a whole bunch of these calls into the market at whatever the bid price was in order to, um, in order to offset a call spread. So if they were taking a bullish call spread for January or a bullish call spread for this week, it is possible that perhaps they, um, they sold those calls into the market while they were buying calls that were closer to the money and also uh, closer in expiration. But so far, I don't see any other significant uh, calls on the call chain at any of the other major price levels or strikes that would match up with this bet. So that doesn't make much sense to me. So I'm, uh, I, I would tend to believe that most of these calls are being held by a, uh, a very large whale or institutional investor who is uh, bullish on the stock overall. And the last stock that I'll touch on for today is Biora Therapeutics, which we uh, we listened in on their earnings call early on this week uh, on Monday, and it was a really great earnings call. We heard a lot of really good news. Um, financially, the company is in a very strong position. They've been reducing their expenses, improving their balance sheet, and uh, they actually had a really nice wicking bounce off of their two their 100 period moving average, which is now acting as support for the stock. So this is now a line. Uh, which I do not anticipate us crossing at any point in the near term. So with Biora now testing uh, the $1 range, I would uh, expect this is a good area to start accumulating shares for the long term. Uh, just to be very clear uh, with everybody, I'm, I'm not doing these weekly calls, at least not with the anticipation that they will go in the money. If I'm doing any kind of weekly or monthly call bets, it's because I'm just scalping uh, rather than taking a long-term position. My long-term position has me all the way out into January of 2024 with a whole bunch of calls sitting at that, uh, at that uh, price of $1 to $2 per share. I'm anticipating that Biora will be going to a much, much higher price target, uh, retesting previous highs and going beyond $10, going beyond 2024. So I'm using this as an accumulation opportunity where I am trying to grab as many shares as I can between now and uh, January of 2024. Um, this is a this is a very long strategic bet, so I can't emphasize that enough. This isn't a squeeze play in the traditional sense. I am playing this to the upside over a very, very, very long period of time. So I don't want everybody to be chasing this play, thinking that they're going to see uh, that they're going to see Biora shoot to the moon and go from ninety cents all the way to twenty dollars in just a week. This for me is a long term investment. And I am putting money into it over the long run with the anticipation that Biora could eventually go on to challenge companies of similar size and structure as Dexcom and, uh, and other pharmaceutical giants. That's going to be it for this video. I want to thank you for tuning in and also for listening to this long video. I'm sorry it went on for so long, but uh, hopefully you got some value out of it. You've got a plan going on into the next week and several months. And I hope that we all come out on the other side of this crash better for it. Thank you all so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next week at the Bell. Until then, have a hell of a weekend.